Hi everyone, Hi. you've got Dr. Picton here and me, Callista. We're going to go through some of your silly questions. Indeed, some aren't silly actually, but uh, yeah, there's a, there's a good mix. Yeah, good mix. we're going to try and keep it lighthearted. That's what it's meant to be, but still informative as we do. For sure. So we hope you enjoy this video. There was a whole lot around sex, of course, this is fertility. Well, for sure. So um, if there's particular positions, if I should be laying still or my legs up, or will this help me determine the sex of my baby? I think there are a lot of myths and out there and one of the, the most common ones is whether or not you can change the gender based on timing of the intercourse mm. and and to be honest the answer is not reliably it's not in right. any measurable or repeatable way in terms of of improving chances well the answer is no there's not a particular position which is going to change your chances of, of being successful right. and, uh, and my legs up no no. Not even for half an hour? I, I think it's irrelevant. <laughs> the second batch of questions was the more embarrassing one. I think feminine hygiene is important uh, for all women. And I think if there is something that is concerning to you, that should be discussed with your gynecologist mm. uh, and brought to their attention. Certainly if it's enough for you to feel self-conscious, yes. um, then you should be having a, a, a conversation with your gynecologist to say, look, I'm uncomfortable about this. Uh, am I just overly self-aware or is this something which is actually sinister? It's a, a symptom of something else. I think when in doubt, ask your gynae and follow their advice regarding specific products. Okay, let's get on to some of the fertility myths now specifically mm. and the negative taboos that we hear around this topic. And while we on like the herbal remedies, because I mean we see this all the time, all sorts of fertility supplements, um, even eating certain foods that are really good for your fertility, quote unquote, was helping you to get pregnant. So I think the only the only um, dietary modification that can assist realistically with fertility mm. is looking at at weight right. and how that pertains to uh, weight loss or weight gain in order to have a body mass index which is ideal. Yes. So so patients that are significantly underweight with right. a very low body fat percentage may stop ovulating. The majority of the patients would be patients who are overweight and we know that that is associated with uh, a change in the ovarian response right. um, and and simply by losing or being in a downward trend with weight for overweight patients may improve their spontaneous ovulation right. and their chances of, of conceiving. Yeah. I, th I think in terms of specific dietary requirements, mm. if it was that easy, right. we would simply prescribe some form of yes. food supplement yes. or a particular food sort. It's not that easy. Right, right. right. Um, another one was talking about embryo glue and endostrap where we are now is to perhaps assess the inside of the, the cavity of the uterus and decide who needs these things. Is it for everyone? Mm. Is it for particular patients? Mm. Does it have an advantage? What's the numbers needed to treat? You know, one has to do this by case by case Absolutely. and weigh it up. It's not certainly not something that we would um, advocate for every single patient for every single transfer. Right. And then such a lovely question. Does IVF actually work? <laughs> Yes, actually. Um, <laughs> so, so IVF works for certain. Uh, one has to define for who. Yes. There's some basic things we need. We need eggs of a reasonable quality. Yes. We need sperm of a reasonable quality. We need a uterus right. of a reasonable quality. There are patients who have combinations of these which can work and offer great success. And then you've got patients who either have no eggs, right. no sperm, right. no uterus. No uterus. Yeah or none of the three right. and so so one has to look at these things individually mm. and say well when when someone says i haven't been successful Correct. you've got to look at them and say well what was different about you yes. compared to the vast yes. group of patients and and yeah so ivf offers a lot of patients uh, an opportunity, an opportunity to be parents yeah. which would never be possible in absolutely. a natural sort of environment absolutely um, so so yes, we have a lot of success stories. And yes, yes there are patients who, who maybe walk away not being pregnant. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of an enigma about what IVF entails. And right. the reason for that is that it's basically ignorance. Yes. So the more ignorant we are about something, the more we question its validity, right? Yes. 
And, um, and the more information you have, the less scary it seems, the less intimidating it seems. For everything else, you would trust medicine. You, I mean, you would yes. trust people to go to ICU and be saved. Yes. You would trust people to I'm go watching. for a surgery and yeah. be saved. Um, but when it comes to reproductive health, we somehow have a yes. different framework. We say, yes. well, well, if someone has cancer, they should be helped. If someone needs ventilation, they should be ventilated. Mm. But if someone wants a baby, mm, how does that differ? Yeah. Oh, you know. Exactly right. So, exactly right. Yeah. If only we could have you in our pockets. <laughs> right? And moving on. Mm. The a lot of the questions that we got in surprisingly was around embryo transfers. So all sorts of questions about what they should be doing prior to transfer, at the transfer, just after the transfer in that dreaded two week wait. Mm -hmm. Some people saying we shouldn't shower or we should be keeping socks on to keep our uteruses warm. <laughs> so maybe give us a little walkthrough on embryo transfer. So, so the socks are simply to keep your feet clean <laughs> so that you don't walk barefoot. <laughs> through our ward, right? <laughs> um, your uterus is at 37 degrees because it's inside your body. And, and the why same why goes, won't an embryo fall out when they go pee? Well, wanna... simply, yeah. the, the embryo is inside the uterus. It's not yeah. inside the bladder. Yeah. And they're quite sticky. So, so the embryos, we always look at the embryo transfer catheter after the embryo transfer to ensure that none of the embryos have stuck to the inside or the outside of the catheter. Wow. That's how sticky they are. Wow. And if we had to transfer this into a natural sort of situation, I'm not yes. suggesting you can extrapolate everything, but if this was natural conception, one, you wouldn't even know you were pregnant yet Absolutely. during those first two weeks <laughs> because the test would be negative. You would be carrying on with yes. your life as is. Yes. So we, I'm mm. not saying be flippant or take yes. a risk. What Absolutely. I'm saying is you know, see it in perspective Absolutely. and, and, and don't, uh, you know, don't believe everything that's up. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. All right, so we move on to our last section, which was a little bit more specific to VitaLab, or at least specific to doctors who are within reproductive medicine, talking about clinics and treatments. The first question was around epigenetics. So I think it's first it's important to know what's ge genetics and what's epigenetics. Right. right. So genetics refers to the, the chromosomal makeup, the gene code right. for building a person. And that right. gene code is surrounded by proteins and and a lot of them are histones, it's related to the packaging and the microenvironment okay. around that DNA. That's the epigenome. Okay. So epigenetics modifies how the gene expression takes place. Genes can okay. be turned on like a rheostat, like a dimmer switch, right. or turned down a little bit. Right. Makes sense. Right. So in the shaping of the potential, yes. it allows for the potential to be expressed. Right. So in terms of shaping the individual, mm from one person to a different person yes. that's asking a lot no. we all participate in an anonymous collection of data right. so that the data from all clinics in south africa is is held yes. together and yes. we can say this is how many cycles of ivf were initiated in south africa in this year right. this is the number of transfers this is the average pregnancy rate mm. we offer evidence-based medicine based on the patient's prognosis and underlying pathology perfect you know when we look at the pre-IVF workup, yes. one of the things we do is an HSG where okay. we look at, at the, the hysterosalpingogram to look at the uterine cavity and also to, to assess the fallopian tubes. Right. And very often that is not to see whether the tubes are in fact open, it's to see whether they are closed. Right. When one has an ectopic pregnancy, I don't know if this question was relating to ectopic pregnancy prior to IVF or right. following or IVF. Following, yeah. So very often patients with tubal factor infertility will present with an ectopic pregnancy right. and very often their, their contralateral tube is also diseased because the process right. is within the pelvis and it's affected both tubes, right? Okay. And so they have a risk if the second tube is still mm -hmm. open of having tubal disease yes. there as well yes. and having a second ectopic pregnancy in the remaining tube right. or in cases where they've had a salpingostomy where they where they, they were operated for their ectopic pregnancy and the doctor tried to save the tube. Right. Even though they've removed the ectopic pregnancy and the tube is still intact, yeah. mm. it may not be functional. So, right. so they have a risk of, right. of developing ectopic right. pregnancy again. So after that, so they've, let's say your first child in pregnancy was IVF, successful, you've had your caesarean delivery, how long before they can come back to Vita Lab to try again for their number two? And the reality is we don't have an answer for that. Okay. Um, 
doctors have always sort of said, well, you wait six months yes. between, you know, having had this pregnancy yes. and then going on to the next. I think that was based on a, a sort of general feeling that perhaps that was, you know, feeling that everything should have healed itself by right. I, I don't think it was based on real statistics. I think yes. it was just based on a, a rough yes. sort of educated guess. Mm. Um, I think the other thing is to ask, well, is this patient breastfeeding or not? Absolutely. So, because if you're breastfeeding, uh, your prolactin is going to be high, right. uh, you're going to have switched off um, ovulation, uh, yes. you're going to possibly have amenorrhea during that time, in other words, right. no menstrual cycles. Right. And we wouldn't really be looking at instituting a new IVF cycle for someone yes. that's breastfeeding. Yes. So we would say once you've finished with breastfeeding mm -hmm. and you are no longer expressing any breast milk, that would be the time to look at that. Right. So, so I think one has to, um, you know, separate those two. So Absolutely. I think you try and integrity, there's no hard and fast rule. Right. We know there's women that have fallen pregnant far earlier than, than right. a six month period. Right. And in terms of breastfeeding, when it's done, yes. and then, yeah. And we've heard of so many who fall pregnant naturally after IVF. Oh, for babies. sure. You know, we actually had a question like that in here if it's possible. So like you said, of course it's know. possible. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you. We have got into the end of Is this list. Well done. And um, I think we've covered huge ground. Excellent. And as always, you are just the very best. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>